week we go to the scriptures because it's there we find the person and work of Jesus. Um, and our sermon this week comes from Mark 4, 30 to 34. Um, it says, and he said, uh, this is Jesus speaking, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable should we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nest in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them and as they were, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Hey, good morning. Peace be with you. My name is Paul Ramsey. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, it's good to see you this morning. Um, if this is your first time here, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, we want you to know how welcome you are here. We hope you feel welcome here. Uh, I know that I can speak for every member of Sojourn uh, when I tell you we look forward to hearing your story. We look forward to sharing ours, and we're so grateful for the way that, uh, that, that the Lord has allowed our paths to cross together this morning. Good morning to those of you who are online as well. I apologize up front. I'm recovering from sinus surgery, uh, and so the swelling is coming down, uh, but I have tested negative for COVID in the past couple of days. Just wanted to reassure you of that as we begin. Today, I have the privilege of preaching a standalone sermon, which means that this is not a part of a series. Instead, I had the opportunity to pray and select a text to preach from uh, that I believe would be encouraging for us here at Sojourn in this season. And in this season, really this year, my mind has gone many times to this particular passage, the parable of the mustard seed. Uh, and I believe and hope that it will be encouraging for us this morning. The Gospel of Mark is one of the first four books of the New Testament called the Gospels. They tell the story of the life and ministry of Jesus uh, and what is called the Gospel, the good news message that Jesus came to proclaim. To give a bit of context, because we're jumping right into the middle of the story, we're entering chapter four part of the way through a string of parables that Jesus is telling to a very large crowd that is gathered around him at the Sea of Galilee. There's so many people there that he has gotten onto a boat and pushed off from the shore so that his voice could carry over the water and be heard by all those gathered. So it was, would have been quite the scene. And he's been telling parables, which are stories that use every, everyday situations like farming, uh, gardening, fishing, housekeeping, life with your family, and so on, in order to reveal things that are true about what Jesus calls the kingdom of God. The thread that runs through this particular string of parables in Mark chapter 4 uh, is that all of these parables, uh, Jesus uses the image of seeds and their growth to describe the nature of the kingdom of God. He started with the parable of the sower, which talks about the struggle that seeds face when they're planted, depending on the kind of soil they land in. He moves on to a parable of a seed growing, where he again compares the kingdom of God to a farmer scattering seed, but this time he tells it to help his disciples deal with the apparent inaction of the kingdom of God, to encourage them to patience. And then the third and final parable in Mark chapter 4, which I want to look at together for a few minutes, is the parable of the mustard seed. And uh, you see, as I consider the moment that we're in with this pandemic that is raging, a yet unresolved election, extended families that are fracturing due to political views and views on the virus, financial, economic uncertainty, uh, racial tensions in our country. There's a lot that is happening right now. In a time where a lot is happening, it can be tempting to think that God has taken a back seat in the events of the world. But I hope that, I think through this passage, God will encourage us that that is not the case. And so let's look together at Mark chapter 4 for a couple of minutes. As we look at this passage, here's my plan. Since it's a short passage, I want to read the words again for you. And then I want to, over the next 20 minutes or so, walk us through three things that I think that Jesus is inviting us to through this passage. With that, let's jump in. Uh, verse 30. And Jesus said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. And yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. 
For the first thing that, that I think Jesus is inviting us to in this passage, I want to begin with a question. Right in these opening words, Jesus is preparing to compare the kingdom of God with something. Verse 30, and he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? And here's the question. Why the comparison? Why doesn't he just say, this is what the kingdom of God is? You might be here wondering what the kingdom of God is. If you're a Christian in the room and you're at least familiar with the concept of the kingdom of God, think of where you learned what the kingdom of God is. Can you name for me a verse in the Bible where the Bible tells you this is what the kingdom of God is? You probably can't. Jesus talks a lot about the kingdom of God. We are taught to pray that the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven. We are told to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. We're told that the kingdom of God is already here, that it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit and even that the kingdom of God is within us. But Jesus never says the kingdom of God is and then gives a direct definition. It's always the kingdom of God is like. And why is that? Why all the comparisons? Well, let me make an attempt at answering this question uh, in, in this one way. There's a difference between direct knowledge and analogical knowledge, between knowing something directly and knowing something by analogy. Knowing something directly means that you know something uh, in itself, whether through your senses, through learning, through the intellect. Um, knowing something analogically or by analogy is knowing something not directly, but by its association or comparison with something else. And so think of a three-year-old kid who knows that a crayon writes on paper. She knows this directly because she's seen it happen, having done it herself. Now think of that same three-year-old understanding why she's not allowed to drive. She may ask you why she's not allowed, and you might, you could explain that she doesn't have her driver's license, that she's not old enough. When she is old enough, she'll get to take a test. But the problem with that is that you just answered her question by giving her two or three concepts that she probably doesn't understand yet. Right? She doesn't know what a driver's license is. She doesn't know what a test is. She probably doesn't understand the concept of age yet or what it means that she's not old enough. And so instead, you might tell her something like, you know how there's some things like at the pool uh, where you're not big enough to go down the big slide because your head isn't reaching, it doesn't reach the line on the sign yet? It's kind of like that. You need to wait until you grow, and then you'll be able to drive. Using something she is familiar with to explain something she's unfamiliar with is giving her analogical knowledge. There's a lot missing in that explanation, but it doesn't mean it's bad or that you're withholding the truth for her. It's actually loving. It's condescending in a loving and beautiful way, speaking on her level so that she can understand as much as possible. So in these parables, in other words, when Jesus teaches about the kingdom of God by analogy, he's not keeping secrets from us. He's actually speaking in a way that we can begin to understand and wrestle with. As it says in verse 33, Jesus, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Jesus' Jesus's intent was not to obscure or uh, uh, to obscure the truth, but to invite us to dig. Just a few verses earlier, Jesus had said, verse 24, if anyone has ears, let him hear. Pay attention to what you hear. He knows that not all will be able to receive his teaching and that even those who can will not understand right away. But this is right in line with how he teaches about the kingdom, the growth of the kingdom of God. It's progressive but gradual, both in the world and in the lives of individual believers. And so why the comparisons? We are not yet able to fully comprehend the reality of the kingdom of God in its fullness. But rather than simply remaining silent, Jesus gives intentional, purposeful hints that begin to shine light in gradual fashion on the glorious reality that will one day cover the earth. And we've got to search for it. Matthew 7, verse 7, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And so that's the first thing I think that we're invited to in this passage. In the way that this passage is structured, we're invited to search. To Jesus' hearers who were surprised when the arrival of this supposed messianic king didn't fix everything immediately, who were wondering if this little radical seeming movement would get off the ground at all, Jesus said, listen, let me invite you to take a step towards me, towards the journey to understanding, beginning the arduous walk of faith. It's a narrow path, but on it you will find life and a God who is in full control, who cares for you. For us today, the, the invitation is no different. Lean in, listen to what Jesus has to say, and prepare to be chewing for a while based on what you hear. So with us leaning in, let's look at the second invitation. After that, 
uh, uh, or for that rather, let's look at the second, a second question. Why does Jesus use the mustard plant in particular as a comparison for the kingdom of God? We see Jesus' focus is on the contrast between the initial and final states of a mustard seed. It goes from being the smallest of all seeds on the earth to being larger than all the garden plants. And uh, I remember a long time hearing, a, a long time ago, hearing a man uh, preach on this parable, teach on this parable, uh, and he made a big deal about the size of the mustard tree, how it's one of the biggest trees out there. Uh, and he pulled up a picture of a mustard tree uh, that looks like this one. Krista, would you pull up the first picture? looks like that one. There's a little mustard seed up in the left, and there's the mustard tree. And I uh, uh, got this picture from Google, um, or the next one. Can you pull up the second one, Krista? One that looks like that one. Another big, tall, full-looking tree. But what I noticed is that all of the pictures like these ones came from Christian devotional sites, which themselves referenced other Christian devotional sites as the sources for those photos. The problem is that these are not mustard trees. The mustard plant is actually a large bush rather than a tree the way that we commonly think about it. It's usually around 8 to 10 feet tall, but occasionally as tall as 20 feet. Uh, Would you pull up the third picture? There you go, Krista. That that is the mustard plant. Um, And if you pull up the next one, actually, this is a man standing in the middle of a a mustard uh, field covered by mustard bushes. In fact, could you go back to the second picture, Krista? to that second tree. Um, In this picture, it is likely that the field is actually the mustard bush, not the tree itself. And this makes sense, given Jesus' words in our passage. We're done with those pictures. If you look at verse 32, Jesus doesn't say that it's larger than all the other trees. He says, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. And to tell you a little bit more about mustard, the actual growth rate of the mustard plant is, I think, what Jesus is focusing on here, and it's what's remarkable. Jesus' hearers would have known this. I, I've heard the mustard plant in the Mediterranean world compared to kudzu here. You know what kudzu is. It's a very invasive species that grows very quickly, and before you know it, it'll cover a tree or a whole thicket of trees. That's how the mustard plant was seen back then and is seen even today. It grows like a weed. One biologist describes the mustard plant like this. It's an invasive plant that will consume a whole countryside in a short time. The plants grow so tightly together, they create an unsurpassable thicket that becomes a home to many species of bird, insect, and rodents. It literally becomes its own ecosystem. There was an LA Times article that I found from a few years ago that was entitled, This Super Bloom is Pretty Dangerous. Invasive Mustard is Fuel for the Next Fire. It talks about the introduction of mustard into Western California, and the tone was one of lament. There's some highlights that are worth sharing from that article. It is something people tend to misunderstand, said Judda Berger, the science science program director for the California Invasive Plant Council. They see a nice yellow field in the distance, but on closer inspection, it's a mustard field. Park officials want to prevent other invasive species from taking over the way mustard has come to dominate the landscape. It's a terrible invasive species, said one. It's so widespread, it doesn't meet the criteria of being something we can actually manage on a large scale. Just one more. Scott Steinmaus, the head of a local university's horticulture and crop science department, said this. No way we are going to get rid of black mustard. We have so much of it. We can try to protect areas that don't have a lot of it yet, but we will never eradicate black mustard. That is what Jesus is giving us to compare the kingdom of God with. It's almost, if you'd permit me this analogy today, it's almost virus-like. While I don't love that analogy, I didn't love it even before this pandemic, I think it's helpful too. You know how a virus works. It infects one, and then it multiplies, and then goes off to infect others. All, All of the talk these days about social distancing, mask wearing, medical treatments, vaccines, is about containing and eradicating the threat. But what Jesus is saying here is that the kingdom of God just happens to be an uncontainable threat. In the words of Scott Steinmaus, that accidental prophet who was the head of that horticulture department, no way we are going to get rid of the kingdom of God. We have so much of it. We can try to protect areas that don't have a lot of it yet, but we will never eradicate the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is coming, Jesus is saying in this parable. The kingdom of darkness will try to suffocate and eradicate its spread where it can, but it can't be successful. The darkness simply cannot overcome the spreading light, as Jesus himself says. In Matthew 16, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
So Jesus tells this parable to his hearers to acknowledge that what they're seeing right now is small, but it will grow and it will become larger than they could possibly imagine. And this is what we see in the history of the church. Those who witnessed the initial proclamation of the kingdom saw a small beginning. There were dozens with Jesus that grouped up into hundreds and eventually thousands. By the end of Jesus' ministry, there were still just several thousand followers of Jesus. And at the very end, even after his resurrection, the number had dwindled down to a mere 120 people. It is these 120 people, though, who were given the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, nearly 2,000 years ago, who saw the beginnings of this explosive movement of disciples making disciples, planting churches that planted churches that quickly covered the face of the known world. And ever since then, all we've seen in the history of the church is what Jesus is talking about here. Although the darkness continues to attempt to stifle the kingdom's growth, and at times seems to infiltrate the ranks of the kingdom of God in the church, yet the kingdom continues to grow spreading to new peoples, new areas, transforming more hearts, more communities with each passing day and with each passing moment. I've read a lot of research lately that talks about the sad state of the American church. One article from Pew Research says that both Protestantism and Catholicism are experiencing losses of population share, with adults in the United States responding uh, with a decrease of 12% of the total U.S. population over the past decade in uh, professing Christianity from 77% down to 65% of the population in just 10 years. Religious nuns, those who answer none of the above on religious identification surveys, are the fastest growing cohorts of uh, young adults in the United States. Younger generations are leaving mom and dad's church, and fewer and fewer young Americans are finding their way into the churches. And today, the coronavirus pandemic has interrupted our social collective rhythm so much that uh, I've heard people around the country wondering if the Christian church will ever fully recover to its position in American society from before. It is true that there's a lot shifting in our culture right now and in our world at a very fast pace. There's demographic shifts, there's moral shifts, economic shifts, religious shifts. There's a lot going on in the world right now. There's a good chance that religious expressions of Christianity that we've come to associate with, uh, with, with the church um, are fading away. But it's also true that there are new expressions of Christian faith and Christian community and disciple making that are popping up in this city and cities like this one all around the world. I think the key to grasping what Jesus is saying in this parable is at the expense of uh, stating the obvious, the key to hearing this is effective hearing. The subject of this whole chapter, Mark chapter four, really is the difference between effective and ineffective hearing. It is only by hearing that you will catch what Jesus is saying. It's only by hearing that one gains access into the kingdom of God. And this is nothing new. Ever since the creation of humanity in the Garden of Eden, God has always desired to have a people of the ear who would trust in his word. When he first created humanity, he gave them his word, his good and gracious commission and command. The fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden happened not through the ear, but through the eye. Satan, in the form of a snake, spoke to Eve. And do you remember what he promised her? Genesis 3, verse 5. He said, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Let me read on and listen to the role that the eyes play in this account. Genesis 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened. And from that moment on, all of humanity has lived a life focused on what is pleasing to the eyes. Riches, strength, beauty, pomp, circumstance, you name it. And also from that moment on, God has been calling his people back from living in accordance with what their eyes see to what they hear from him. Jesus is saying, listen, you must hear your way into the kingdom. Verse 33, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. In a moment in history, when our eyes are so easily drawn to what is going on in the world, when our eyes are so easily drawn to conclude things are going not well right now, the world is falling apart. Jesus wants us to know that regardless of what you and I or anyone else does, the spread of the kingdom is inevitable. It doesn't hinge on the strength of the opposition as if God is somehow crossing his fingers that the kingdom of darkness blows its battle plans. No, it is gradual, purposeful, and inevitable. God's kingdom will spread no matter what in God's timing, in accordance with God's plan, and by God's power. 
That's the second invitation that Jesus is making to us. Will you listen? Will you trust? This kingdom cannot be shaken. The third observation I want to make for us is this. I want to point out a couple of things that Jesus says in this parable that would have stuck out in particular to his Jewish listeners. Right at the beginning, verse 30, Jesus says, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parables shall we use for it? Listen to Isaiah 40, verse 18. To whom then will you liken God or what likeness compare with him? Do you hear the similarity between those words? Jesus' Jewish hearers would have heard it too. Jesus' words would have jogged their minds back to the Old Testament. And in verse 32, we see why Jesus did this. Look at what Jesus says about birds and branches. Verse 32. Yet when the mustard seed is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Why does Jesus talk about birds making nests in the shade of a mustard plant? It seems a bit random. The parable doesn't actually seem that it would be missing anything if this detail was left out. But a good rule to follow, as one Bible culture scholar I appreciate says often, is that if a detail seems a bit out of place to our ears, um, we should probably flip back in our Bibles because it's probably in the text. And sure enough, the image of birds finding rest in the shade of branches is a familiar one from the Old Testament. To give an example, the prophet Ezekiel, in several places, refers to a tree that God will plant to be a blessing to the nations as a fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that his family would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Listen to just two passages out of Ezekiel. Chapter 17, verse 23. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar, and under it will dwell every kind of bird. In the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. You hear that? One more, chapter 31, verse 6, Ezekiel writes, All the birds of the heavens made their nests in its boughs. Under the branches, all the beasts of the field gave birth to their young, and under its shadow lived all great nations. This parable, then, doesn't just give us a picture of the powerful growth of the kingdom of God despite its humble beginnings. It also gives us a window into the very character of the kingdom of God. We see here a picture of God's grace to all of the nations, not just his own people. You see, at the core of Jesus' ministry, in the depths of God's heart is love, love for his people, love for the whole world. Jesus' ministry is not primarily about winning battles and declaring victory for victory's sake. It's primarily a rescue mission. His beloved children have been lost ever since they were tempted and led away from him by the prince of darkness. And his plan for all of time has been to come back for them, to come back for us, to rescue us from the grip of the enemy. Jesus, in these words and throughout his whole ministry and with his very life, is calling us, inviting us back to our Father. Come, he says, in this parable of a mustard seed. Find shade in the branches of this tree the spreading thicket of trees, the kingdom of God, which has come from heaven down to earth in order that you might have life with God once again. Do you hear him calling? And listen, Jesus knew that the growth of this mustard thicket, the growth of the kingdom of heaven would cost him his very life. And knowing that, the way that Jesus tells this parable here is particularly deliberate. The words of the Old Testament Prophets focused on large royal trees like the noble cedar from Ezekiel 17. And Jesus here uses simply a mustard plant. His point, made through irony, is loud and clear. This glorious kingdom, this glorious response of God to the promise that he made to Abraham is coming through humble means, starting small, and not just small, but paradoxically, with the death of its king in a way that will blossom, in a way that will cover the earth. And the invitation is this, come and rest in his shade. I know a lot of people who want to make the world a better place, who want to pursue love, to speak well, to seek after the life and health of their neighbors. But at the same time, so many of those people are struggling to think that they have their own lives together, racked with uncertainty, doubt, struggling with anxiety, barely holding on to their sanity at times. Sometimes they're wearing the mask of adequacy and confidence, projecting an image of control and confidence, but inwardly they're exhausted. I found myself on both sides of that more frequently than usual, we'll say, this year. 
The answer, Jesus tells us, is that this kingdom that he came to bring, bringing heaven itself down to earth that we might find rest in the shade of his branches. The question is, have we found that shade? Have you found that shade? Are you resting underneath these branches? Sojourners, do you know God and are you resting in him? Is his faithfulness to you a platitude that you're used to repeating while you try to pull yourself and your life together or is it the very foundation of your soul leading to a place of rest precisely when you don't have things all together? Hear Jesus' gentle words of invitation, come home. Come to me and I will give you rest. Don't miss one of the most important things in the Christian walk, which is to be marked by freedom and peace. Don't miss that it is only those who have found rest themselves who can offer rest to others. It is only those who have received peace who can offer that peace to others. It is only those who have found the abundance of joy who can offer that joy to others. It is only those who know how deeply they are loved who can truly be freed to love in that way. So come. That's the third invitation that God is extending to us through this passage. Come and find rest in the shade of these branches. Taste and see that the Lord is good so that you can be welcomed into the family that grows out and becomes branches to offer shade to more and more who so desperately need it. And as I close, the first invitation is the invitation to search, to lean in, to listen. Are you frustrated? Are you lost? Are you tired, distracted, confused, disillusioned? Where are you looking for your answers? Turn towards Jesus and begin walking, begin searching. Bring your questions. Along with your questions, bring a patient expectation to God's word, to the community of God's people as we each take the next step of faith on the journey that God has invited us into. The second invitation is the invitation to trust. To trust not what we see, but what we hear and what Jesus is telling us. Into a world that may look to the eye as though things are falling apart. Into a life that may look to your eyes or to the eyes of those around you to be falling apart and good for nothing. Into, into that, God speaks gentle words of comfort, of confidence, of assurance. Behold, I am making all things new. Are you afraid, hopeless, angry, losing sleep over all that is going on in the world? then whose voice are you listening to? Who told you that things are falling apart? Incline your ear to God and to his words and ask him for the help that you need to believe and to trust. The seed that is planted and its growth cannot be thwarted, not by anyone, not by any nation, not by any virus, not by any demographic trend. Nothing can thwart, can, can thwart the spread of the kingdom of God. It is often quiet and gradual, but it is purposeful, it is powerful, and it is unstoppable. And the third invitation is to come and find rest in his branches so that you may join with his people in order to bring the shade, rest, joy, life, love that you have found to others. Are you wanting to be a beacon of light in a dark world but finding that you have so little in the tank to give because you're struggling to keep your own life together? Then come to Jesus and find rest from which you can extend that same rest to others. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this, your word, that you've given us uh, in the scriptures to teach us about ourselves, to teach us about you, to draw us into relationship with you. Help us to trust you, Lord. Help us to heed your invitation to search, to trust, and to come and find rest in you. Reveal to us, Lord, what is keeping us from that so that we can together continue to extend this wonderful kingdom of God with all of its life, love, and joy into a world that so desperately needs it. Empower us to do so, Lord, for your glory, for our good, and for the good of our neighbors. We ask in Christ's name. Amen.